Hi, my name is Bhupen Sharma and welcome to my course Spring Boot, a complete guide from development to deployment. I'm a huge fan of Spring Framework and developing applications for more than nine plus years. And from last four years, I'm focusing on Spring Boot. What I like about Spring Boot is the opinionated approach to the configuration, which makes which make us become more productive by focusing on the business issues rather than focusing on the configurations which we faced uh, during the normal spring framework development in this course we'll start from the basics and learn all the key feature of spring boot uh, from development to the deployment some of the major topics that we will cover in this course would be development environment setup demo applications overview for the course creation of rest web services creation of sample web application profile and properties logging security and some of the production grade features like actuator then we end up with the deployment so before we start this course you should familiar with maven and spring framework and if you already have a knowledge on spring boot it's good to have so let's get started hello everyone this is bubin sharma and in this video we'll discuss about spring boot so let's get started why Spring Boot? While working with the Spring Framework, you might have noticed uh, below pain points. One of them is that provide all the compatible libraries for a specific version of Spring and configure them. Take example of Spring with Hibernate. So you, it should have a compatible version with Hibernate. Otherwise, your Spring might not work with Hibernate the way it's supposed to. The second point is majority of the time we configure data source, transition manager, entity manager, beans, sources in the same way. Now we ask this question if the majority of the time we are using the same configuration and tweaking them little bit based on our need, it would be better if we can automate them. Welcome to Spring Boot. And it is exactly doing what we talked earlier and it is simplifying a Spring for everyone. Now what is Spring Boot? It's a framework which has written on top of Spring to ease the bootstrapping and development of new Spring applications. As you see in the diagram, uh, Spring Boot sits between the user and the Spring framework so that it can use the whole ecosystem of a Spring. Uh, it provides default code annotations to quick start your project. It builds production grade applications which is available for deployment as soon as possible with so many features like actuator, logging, security, so fast. It follows the opinionated configuration approach, so it faster your development time. So in simple world, if I have to explain Spring Boot, it is a Spring Framework plus your embedded servers minus your XML bean configuration. So that is pretty much what Spring Boot defines itself. Now I have listed out few of the advantage. There are much more advantage, uh, but few of them is it is very easy to integrate your Spring Boot applications with the Spring ecosystem, which includes JDBC, ORM, data, security, batch, and all sort of things. Cloud. It has uh, embedded HTTP servers like Tomcat and Jetty, which gives us the flexibility to start your applications faster. Uh, multiple mode of deployments as well it has uh, plugins uh, it it provides a lot of plugin to develop and test your spring boot applications and has a build tool like maven and gradle comes with limitations they are not much limitations but i f i found out one or two based on my experience and one is that starting a new project is very easy in a spring boot but if, if you're trying to convert your existing Spring MVC project uh, or a Spring project to a Spring Boot, you find it a little frustrating because a lot of things has been auto-configured automatically in Spring Boot and your Spring project might have those XMLs which is not very easy to automate them. So you might have to override your Spring Boot uh, auto-configuration classes and that might be a little tricky and frustrating as well. And the second point is also more or less the same based on the first point because we use opinionated approach 
lot of things has been auto configured now if you don't want the all those auto configurations you might have to tweak them or change them and which can be a little frustrating that's all for this video thank you guys hello everyone this is bubain sharma and in this video we will discuss about the prerequisite for a spring boot project to work on and how we can generate a sample spring boot project using a spring initializer ui or using intellij so let's get started so what are the prerequisite we need for a spring boot project to start is first of all is the jdk uh, 1.8 or 1. Point, i think the newer version is 10 build tool either maven or gradle or IDE based on on your own preference you can use IntelliJ STS Eclipse or NetBeans uh, I prefer to use IntelliJ because I'm using most of the time so now let's create a spring boot project using a spring, a spring initializer UI so let's go to star.spring.io and this is the spring initializer UI choose a maven project um, with java and what what is the spring boot version provide a basic information here so let's say open dot in and i can switch to full version where it will show more detail for me but and i can choose these later so let's open a blank project click on generate project uh, and this will download the zip file for me and i can see the zip file has a spring boot project structure and this is a blank structure with the basic classes Now let's discuss about how you can create a Spring Boot project using IntelliJ. Okay, open IntelliJ and click on create new project. And you can see now a Spring Initializer here. Click next and say open dot in demo and click next. Here also it's showing the dependencies here. I can choose. But I can go with a blank project right now and then later on we can add more dependencies. What is the name of the project demo? And let's put on the download folder. Finish. No, let me create a demo here. Okay. So as you can see it create a demo project and it has all those basic informations that's all for this video hello everyone this is bupin sharma and in this tutorial we're going to discuss about demo application overview i took a sample application built from free version of bootstrap 4 um, it's called as sp admin uh, you can go to free bootstrap themes and then you can find that out and I took a sample um, page that is called index.html and then if you look at that page it look like a dashboard page so we are going to work on that dashboard page during the whole course and apply whatever we learn so I divided that dashboard page into a three sections section one is basically the order received and then high level order summary section two is company revenue and best seller category and um, section three is employee information thanks guys hello everyone this is bubin sharma and in this video we are going to create a rest get controller endpoint using a spring boot so let's get started Let's quickly create a project in Spring. 
I'm gonna use propane dot in and say get rest rest and point get and simply generate the project because it is a maven java with the latest version okay i got my project uh what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna open that is in my intellij so here's my intellij and i'm gonna import the project let's go rest and point get and then open So here we have our western point. So let's create a controller package and then um, let's create a class called rest endpoint okay we have to use annotation called rest controller now let's create a rest endpoint so i'll say public course get endpoint and then this will be return course i'll say name and chapters chapter count um, we need to create this class let's create this class and say name mm, let's generate uh, a constructor And I get a setter. So now um, we need to map the parameters. So let's say request request parameter request parameter and say value equals to name we need this request parameter to pass from the url and we can set a default value if you don't want to pass it so default value will say spring boot and then i'll say whether it is required or optional so i'll make it optional uh, and then i assign the variable let me just duplicate that and it will be a chapter count default value will be 2 and then I'll say chapter count so now uh, and then I have to put a request mapping to create my endpoint so let me put just put straight away course it'll be int okay let's compile this project maven compile Okay, there should be no It's done now let's run this application and this application Spring Boot application has an embedded HTTP Tomcat container 
so by default start with 8080 port let's test in the postman okay so here if I just put localhost 8080 and course and hit it I'll get the default values now if I want different one name equals hybris I'll get hybris and then I'll say chapter account equals 6 I'll get the same value that's all for this video thanks guys hello everyone this is Bhupen Sharma and in this video we'll discuss about adding a rest post controller endpoint by using spring boot project so let's get started we need a project uh, I already have the project uh, created just to save the time um, what I did is I just copy all the controllers from the last uh, lecture or video that we have created for the get endpoint so we'll continue from there in a different project so let's create uh, let's return as string and then I'll say save course and then uh, request body I want uh, course to be there course uh, and then I say return your course named course dot get name get name save having m with chapter count so let's um with 10 chapters save successfully saved success fully okay so now uh return successfully let's use dot here close it save it and run okay the thing is we didn't we need to do a request mapping so let's do a request mapping and say method equals to request mapping dot post comma value equals you'll say register you'll say slash register course okay let's compile this one and see whether it compiled uh, compile it compiled successfully so now let's run it let's test in postman how it works out so I still have my old endpoint should work because it's a get endpoint yep it's working now let's create a post and say uh, register the endpoint is register okay register course and if I hit it uh, it will throw me that the request body is missing because if you see the code here I say that my request body is a course so I need to pass the course uh, which is should be like this so let's use this one and put into a row and I'll 
paste it and make it a JSON. Looks better. So I'll say uh, Jackson um, Jersey Kilomet. Let's say like that. And then I'll say it has two chapters and post it. So send. And I'll get a message. Your course named Jersey Client with two, two chapters said successfully. With 200 OK. That's all for this video. Thanks, guys. Hello, everyone. This is Bhupen Sharma. And in this video, we are going to discuss about Spring Boot properties that we are using. So let's get started. So there are a few things that I just want to tell about the properties. The idea of the having a property is to have a lesser configurations uh, when you compare it with the standard string framework. I, I can give you an example. Uh, you have to put a data source uh, in an XML file to configure your uh, Oracle or MySQL. But now you can do the same thing using a property file in a Spring Boot. So there is a concept of uh, default application properties in uh, spring boot called application dot properties whenever you create a project it generate it creates application dot properties and it auto configured with your project so whatever the properties that you gonna put you can inject those those properties in your classes um where the application dot properties there it is in src main resource directory so by using this default file, we don't have to have to explicitly register a property source or even provide a path to a property file because by default it is comes with configure. Now we can we can define another property source or we can configure a path, but we can discuss that in later videos. So what all the properties uh, Spring Boot provides? There are a lot of uh, according to the whole the spring ecosystem for example spring batch has specific properties if you are using a spring actuator it has its own properties if you are using jpa it has its own properties tomcat has its own properties kafka and all those things the other major point is that we don't have to need to specify all the default properties in all the cases we can specify them only on by demand so either you want to change it or you want there is, there is a default configuration for anything and then if you want to override it then only we need to put it so by using this property it reduced a lot of xml uh, configurations and i gave you one of the best example is uh, putting a jndi or putting a data source in the normal spring framework versus spring boot let's go through one of the project and let's see how these property things works so let's start with creating a project. <clears throat> I'll say bootbake.in and understand properties. And I'll say I'll take web and generate project. This project has been created. Now let's open the IntelliJ. So this is my project for the last from the last video. Let's create another one. Um, open and I'm gonna go understand property. I'm gonna register it. Okay. Let's compile it by as it is. Compile and see everything is good. Yep, it's compiled. So if you go and see here uh, in main resource, you'll see this this application dot properties and it is blank because we don't need to specify all the defaults. In case of any overrides or you want to add your own properties, in you might have to specify, but not in case of um, default properties so before we do anything let's just copy the old call to the <coughs> before we move forward 
let's copy uh, the old controllers from the last videos that I created so that it will be easy to understand. So what I'm going to do is uh, I just say copy and then I just put it here and say paste. Okay. So the controllers are there now and let's build it again so i didn't do anything related to properties i just want to make sure that i'm able to build the project with the post controller and get controller and then let's run this application yeah it's just starting in 8080 let's go ahead and test it by ourselves uh, a get call and it is working so now uh, instead of 8080 i want my port to be 9090 so what i'll do is that i'll go here and say server dot port equals to 9090 so this is the first time i'm trying to put any property and saying that no, I don't want to use the default port. And then let's do that. Now. Let's clean, compile it, and see, run it. So now it is start as nineteen ninety. See here, so this request might not work because it's pointing to 8080 yeah so i'm not getting any response so let's change to 90 and 90 here and i can see it's working so this is one of the example where i can define my properties now how to inject those properties if i want to inject so let's create some properties so what we'll do is we'll will replace these default values with the property values so let's do one thing let's uh create a properties so it's a default let's create my own default dot course dot name uh, equals to i'll say sap hana and then default dot course dot um what is the field name you can use the same field name chapter count chapter count uh equals to seven or well, let's put three okay so i created those properties now i want to inject those property so injecting those properties will be very simple you have to just first create the type c name and type the annotation at the value and then you provide the property name So what you're doing is basically you're injecting this property to this variable and then we'll do the same thing for the other one as well so let's put int and chapter count okay and then i'll say here chapter count is the property so now i retrieve those properties in these values but i have to use it so what i'll do is i'll create uh, another endpoint for get and say let me get my default properties what is my default course and then <clears throat> get default course 
okay and then here i will go and just change the reference of values so here um I, I can i can keep it like that that's fine i just need to make sure that it has it has this value it has the value from the properties so instead of chapters count i can put chapters count here because i just want to I don't want to mess with this this is string with this one uh, variable name sorry now uh, so let's compile this project and see whether it is working or not working okay let's run the server again and let's use this one so I should, if I use this endpoint, I should get these two things. It started and then let's use my course. And I got this one. So I got the properties from whatever I put provided in the properties file. That's all for this video. Thanks guys. Hello everyone, this is Bhupen Sharma and in this video we'll discuss about uh, profile specific properties and the hierarchical properties uh, using configuration um, properties annotation. So let's get started. So let's go through a few of the bullet points about environment specific properties. So in Spring Boot, there is a built-in mechanism for targeting a different environments. Um, when you're using dot properties file, what you need to do is you simply say that uh, application hyphen put any name and dot properties that any name can be any environment. You can say QA prod, stage pre prod, or any other environment. And when you run your Spring Boot, you reference that property file using um, spring profile active uh, command so what if you have more than one properties so i have application dot properties i have application keyway dot properties i have application prod dot properties so always the property that you are referencing while running your app it take take a precedent over everything so let's see a sample project for that so what I did is actually uh, I created a project using Spring Initializer UI and then I copied all the um, controller classes from the last uh, demo which has the rest endpoint and then the default properties that we have. So this is the main property file now. Let's say I want to use uh, property for Q environment. So what I'll do is I'll copy and I'll create a, a hyphen QA dot properties and here I'll change my port 1991. Now in QA properties I don't have this chapter count but I have a course name. So I'll say SAP HANA and C4C. So let's save it. So I created a very uh, environment specific property file. Now let's compile this project and see whether it is compiled or not. It's compiled. Now run. Mm. So when I'm running directly, you see that it is referencing to the 1990, which is my main application dot property file. So it is not even considering this one because we need to reference it that I want to run my project for this particular profile. So let's do one thing and let's using MVN terminal command.
so let's run from terminal so I mean clean compile and I'll say compiled and I'll say mvn spring boot hyphen run and now I need to provide spring dot profiles dot active equals the QA which is referencing to the QA file here um, these pro spring profile active <coughs> it creates a system variable which spring will pick it up so when i run this way you see that the following profile so it will tell that the following profile are active which is qa and then you see it open at port as 1991 so now this qa property has the course name but it doesn't have the chapter count so what it will do is that it will override these two properties but it still use third property from the main file so let's try to call through a postman definitely this will not work because there is nothing run on 1990 so it will be 1991 and as soon as I hit it it pick the name property from the active profile but chapter account would picked from the uh, main property file so this is the way the profile specific properties work now let's go and discuss about hierarchical properties we can use at the rate configuration uh, properties and notations where properties are grouped together so i can group and the best example is data source so i can say that data source dot username data source dot url the password the driver configurations i can group together and then make it a, a property configuration uh, these type of properties are mostly type safe because since they, they're part of a java object so you can apply different patterns and all those things you can apply validations you can apply validations that it hasn't i don't want this property to be null what is the minimum length what is the maximum length or if you apply any regex pattern you can apply that um why we are choosing this this approach because at the rate value notation sometimes become cumbersome for many properties so if you have so many properties you have to write at the rate value for everything rather than you can have a, a component created and then you can reference through and you can auto wire that component and use it anywhere you want to use uh, in form of getter and setter so and it supports both properties and yml files so we are going to discuss about yml in the next video uh, let's now focus on properties only so let's see a sample project for this so here uh, i'm continuing with the same project what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna do a little bit change here one is uh, and just put the property as course dot name course just to make a grouping so course dot rating equals to five and then course dot author equals to booping so course is uh, here is a grouping so now let's create a, a configuration so i'll say course um, configuration file let's define with the uh, at the rate component so that it can be auto wired and then it will say configuration properties and then i know i can map through course course okay now let's define the properties so I'll say string name name chapter count rating and author so it'll be and chapter count
rating will be again int author so let's uh generate get range setter okay so this creates a getter setter let's try to compile the project and see whether it's compiling or not it's compiling okay um the next thing that we need to do is we need to test whether it is working so let's first uh, remove those uh, these are the injections so now let's uh, auto wire it so private um, course configuration and I'll say course configuration and at the rate uh, let's use auto wire for a differential purpose let's put these properties again just to have some kind of difference to show so i'll put default dot course name and let's put default dot chapter count so these two will be separate entity i'll say here um what is the latest thing that i'm learning is uh AWS and Docker. Let's see. So I have 45 chapters on this ratings. I know that is same. So here uh, I will still have the same properties. So these are the normal property injection, and this is basically I'm talking about uh, the hierarchical properties. Now where I'm gonna use them? Let's do another rest endpoint let's create another and say um get properties so I'll say get um, just to have get horror kill and try yeah it's a tough spelling <laughs> So I just create an endpoint for the hierarchy um, and then instead of uh, passing a course I'll just say it's map let's put a map hash map uh, let's say string comma object okay and then what I'm going to do is I'll create this okay no or let's see return map so return the map what i'm going to do is map dot put name a comma and i'm going to use configuration from course so course configuration dot get name and then um, I'm going to repeat for um, what is that next one? Chapter count, reading another chapter count, 
rating and author okay mm, get chapter count get rating get author okay so let's compile this and see any issues let's remove the request parameter because we don't need those it is not required let's put this way and compile again okay so now let's see uh, since we have all our rest endpoint ready and now everything just for to validate the type safe thing let's change to rating to uh, alphabet now here we define that as an uh, integer and we pass it a string so when i try to compile this code now it compiles successfully because these errors comes at the runtime because that is the time they load the properties now i'm gonna run it So here you see it says that the property course dot rating is having a value vh because it's failed to convert. So these this become a fail safe uh, or type safe so that we cannot uh, mess with the properties. Now let's change with it and let's see. Now server is running at 1994. Let's check through Postman. 1990 if i call the old api still i get the sap hana because my default property is still sap hana and three now if i use the different rest in mind i should have different values yeah so i have author name chapter count and rating that's all for this video thanks guys Hello everyone, this is Bhupen Sharma and in this video we are going to discuss about using a YML instead of a properties file. So let's get started. So YML is another another format of, um, it's alternate to the properties file and it automatically, Spring Boot automatically supports YML um, if you have a snake YML library to your class pack. YML is good for hierarchical property storage and um, the profile specific storage means you can create a profile very easily with compared to dot properties file. So Spring Framework provides two convenient classes that can be used to load YML document. Now one is uh, YML property factory bean which load YML as a property and one is YML map factory bean load as a map where you have multiple profiles don't have to use those beans straight away because most of the time you don't have to um, face these beans or you have to modify these beans it's behind the scene so what are the shortcomings of the YML file so if you want to use a property source annotation where you'd want to refer your uh, any property specific property to external source or internal source within the class path then YML is not the right option. So there you have to use properties file. Uh, apart from that, um, YML supports any every other feature. The way the property supports. And it has more convenient way actually. So let's run through a sample project and then understand how YML works. So this is the uh, project that I have created from Spring Initializer UI. And I have copied everything that we have done until last demo where we talk about properties, uh, the hierarchy approach, the injection approach, uh, different endpoints. So everything is there in this. So we can proceed further and understand how to use YML. So what I'm going to do is that we know this, this, this is my property. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create another file called 
application dot yml now this yml file and property file has difference so if you know how to write server dot port uh, I'll say 1990 uh, and then we have default dot course um, so let's say default course name uh, and then we have another one is chapter count so name and chapter count is three name is sap hana so I'm just converting our existing property file into a, a YML. So let's run through a course. So course name, chapter count, rating author. So it will be a name, chapter count. I think this is all chapter count. Let's run the same chapter count, rating author so name will be in the person talker and uh, rest of things will be easy 45 uh, it will be 5 and myself okay so I just created a uh, convert a property into a uh, YML let's remove the property file now and see how it works out so I have now YML uh, as soon as you put application.yml your Spring Boot automatically recognize it and map it up so let's try to compile this project terminal let's compile this project domain clean compile and then run this project again spring boot hyphen sorry colon run so it's started now let's check in postman and our so this was the last time when i checked the the hierarchy of endpoint so let's try to check again and then see whether it is same yep i get the same response just to have a verification i can say that uh, aws docker and mesos just to make sure that it is referencing to the correct yaml file so let's clean it then run it okay uh, let's see yeah and then it came here okay so this is how we convert uh, the properties versus vinyl works now it, when it comes to hierarchy where you want not before hierarchy let's talk about mm, how we're gonna work um, with the profile specific how we create a profile in uh, YML file so first thing that we need to do is we need to tell which is the default profile that we need to pick so spring um, then I say profile and then I say dot active I can use this yep and I'll say QA instead of tab now this is one um, how you're gonna reference it having a three lines and it will tell whether 
this particular these properties belong below this properties belongs to a particular profile now how we define that profile let's say so spring dot profile and say def so these properties will be part of a dev profile like that and then i can have a same to say qa and i'll say 91 91 i'll put underscore everywhere just to have so 0 50 underscore underscore just to have a differentiation between qa profile and dev profile now i know that my active profile is qa so if i if i compile and run it it should pick the qa profile yep it picked the qa profile correctly and it got failed so let's see what is the failure reason fail to it's fail to start connector configure to listen on page port 9191 Ooh. let's say 1991 that way So 1991 and now I should have the same but with underscore or zeros at the end. So I have zeros at the end and underscore. So it picked from the QA profile. That's all for this video. Thanks guys. Hello everyone, this is Bhupen Sharma and in this video, we'll discuss about the Embedded Tomcat server. Now we have uh, Jetty and Undertow as another servers, embedded servers with uh, Spring Boot, but mostly we are going to use Tomcat, so I'm just going to discuss about Tomcat. So let's get started. So let's think about if we don't have an embedded server, what we have to do exactly. So we need to create a web application uh, with the format of WAR file, and then we have to have an application server, Tomcat, WebLogic, and their um, Glassfish, uh, all those web servers. Then we have to deploy that WAR file. Now for, for deployment, either I, I can use the scripting or I can use Jenkins to deploy it, deploy the WAR file. So there are multiple process so now if you think about like how much time it is gonna take the whole process uh, we are not sure because your local tomcat might not configure the way your production tomcat is so if you deploy your war file from your local environment to your production environment there is a possibility that it might not work in the productions because productions will have additional security features firewall settings and all those things now what if if i create an application which is has a deployable container unit by itself and spring boot exactly did the same thing they created an application which has a deployable unit uh, with respect to tomcat or jetty or undertow now what what is the advantage i'll get it that but one of the biggest advantage is it's easy to use second advantage is that it compatible with your microservice architecture because you want your every unit to be a uh, independent unit and you should be able to discover that those units 
it is a standard applications uh, and then it is quickly testable when i say quickly testable means you have to just start your jar file and then immediately you can make your application up and running uh, which is quite fast and in from developer's point of view you can debug easily and all those things you can do so yes let's go through the uh, let's create a sample project and then run through it and just understand and let's run through the libraries if i go then what i can see is i can see tomcat libraries one is core the el expression language and the web socket let's use the terminal and we can Arian clean compile by default it will start in 8080 port and I can say embedded tomcat application yeah it started in 8080 port that's all for this video thanks guys Hello everyone, this is Bhupen Sharma and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about how to run your Spring Boot application as a var instead of a traditional jar file. So let's get started. So let's create a project. Let's say Bhupen Mm, external war I'll just I'm gonna include only web and generate project so the project has been generated right now it is mapped as a jar so let's change to war there are few changes that we need to do is one of the changes uh, use a dependency where we say that tomcat is provided so let's say dependency and then it will be org dot spring framework dot tomcat let's say framework dot tom okay it's dot boot i think boot yeah artifact id is um spring boot starter tomcat spring boot starter tomcat here you go and then we need to define the scope as provided so that spring knows spring boot knows that we are going to provide the tomcat then a little bit of change let's do that change here we need to extend spring boot servlet because spring boot servlet initializer and we need to override one of the method which is uh, configure so let's do that all right and then we need to write a configure method so once we do that now if we run the application it should generate a war file let's compile and package it once we package it So here you see we have a war file get created. We can deploy this war file to any application server. That's all for this video. Thanks guys.
Hello everyone, this is Bhupin Sharma and in this video we are going to talk about how to configure logback for logging. Now logging by default is a part of Spring Boot application as soon as you have a web dependency it will come automatically and then you can control logback logging through two ways. One is the property way, the application.property or application.yml or you can control through logback.xml. So let's get started. So what I did is I created a, a project, uh, logback logging, and then I just copied all my old controllers um, so that we have some informations and then we have properties file here. So the first thing that we're gonna try here is uh, with the properties. So let's put, logging dot level and then put the package name where you want to put so i'll say for spring framework web use debug and then for i can use my uh package for info purpose info and then let's run this and see what happens As you see, nothing, there's no file got created, but things are in, logged inside the console. So let's put in the file. So we can put in the file by just using a property file and say log back logging dot log. Save and run it again and see what happens. So now I can see here the file has been created. If I go inside this file, I can see informations are there. And so this is one way of logging um, using a property. And then one more thing that we can do here is we can define the patterns if we want to. I already have those pattern uh, console. I can just put it and I can say that on console define this pattern and then for the file do this pattern so you can define consoles and patterns um console pattern and file pattern using a property let's run and see did we see any changes so i can see changes here and let's see in the file and I can see changes here as well. Previously it was like this format and now it has a different format. So this is one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is uh, using XML. So let's try that way as well. Um, I'm going to use the same configurations but uh, using an XML. So for XML what we need to do is we need to just create a file called logback.xml or logback-spring.xml so let's say logback.xml i already have that xml prepared let's use that uh, what i'm doing is it is uh, i'm saying for the file use logs and logback logging.log um, we have a ruling policy as well whenever after a day what is the log file name look like and where it will go um, and then I have uh, debug and debug for both of them and then it is a file so and those patterns are defined here so let's run it now and yes there's nothing in the property so let's run it and see okay i can see here the log folder has been created uh if i go inside i can see uh, the information 
is passed on yes yeah so this is the way we can do through xml now xml can have more feature we can apply more feature but the same feature can be applied through properties as well so it's depend on your choice what you want and what is looking for that's all for this video guys thanks hello everyone this is bupin sharma and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about how to configure log4j for logging so let's get started so what i did is i created a log4j logging sample project and i copied all my previous controllers so the first thing that the two things that we have to do uh, for log4j configuration is one is that exclusion of the default logback logging and inclusion of the log4j2 dependency so let's do that so we are going to add uh i already have that exclusion list so let's just take it from there and uh, put it so i'll have exclusion of the logging and then inclusion of the log4j dependency so here i have added a log4j2 dependency now what i need to do is uh, i need to add a log4j xml file i can add yml as well and i can add json as well the name should be log4j so i added this one here and i need to define the file appenders console patterns and all those things so i already have a sample created uh we can go through that sample xml so here i created for a console i created for file appenders and then i put loggers where i need to find that okay there is a bupin dot in log 4 g logging package where you need to you need to append into console as well as in file and also you can do for the spring framework dot uh, the root level is error so any error will automatically append it to console or file so that's pretty much the configuration part and let's see whether we are able to test it so we are going to package it So I got the error uh, while compiling the project, but it created the log file. So because I put a reference of log folder, logs folder, and then inside that log for logging, and I can see the log file has been created based on the pattern that we use for awk dot spring framework dot web package and the package that I'm using. So let's fix this problem, but because there is no property defined here. So let me quickly get grab those property from my last project to make it work. So I use these properties. Now let's run it again. it's finished successfully so and I can see in the logging as well the same thing so that's pretty much for this video thanks guys hello everyone this is Bupain Sharma and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about what is JPA and what is Spring Data JPA so let's get started what is JPA JPA stands for Java Persistent API and a Java specification for accessing, persisting, and managing a data between Java objects and database. For that, we are using ORMs. One of the examples is Hibernate, 
which allow you to map your entity classes into a relational mapping so that once you connect with your database your ORM framework will do the transactions mapping and query all those things and JPA is a specification to use URM so it's provide you an interface to access those ORM frameworks in this diagram below you can see we have entity manager entity net transaction entity manager factory persistent query inside a JPA by using entity classes we can connect to RDBMS which is a relational database so this is a standard JPA what is spring data JPA spring data JPA is a separate project within the spring data ecosystem that let you connect with different persistent kind of stores both SQL and NoSQL with much more easier approach so connecting to JPA becomes much more easier in the spring data versus uh, using a JPA standalone in the spring framework but if you see so if you see in the diagram below that you'll find out that this is the air this is the specific area where so if you see within this ecosystem this part is the spring data JPA and then you can connect to your relational database using JPA or JDBC using a JPA JPA repository or JDBC template. So what are the features Spring Data JPA provides? I took these features from the project of Spring IO Spring Data JPA URL and I mentioned in the slide. But specifically if I focus on there are two major ones are is query DSL and the other one is at query annotations at bootstrap time these two things are the major ones where I've once I start implementing these query DSLs and query annotations I feel that JPA become more advanced in terms of how you write your queries how you make your queries more dynamics and all those things so and third thing is that enable JPA repository annotation at the uh, at the print class when you use that and you apply your component scan it will scan all your entities and even though it can scan your entities from a jar file if you provide the location of the package correctly uh, during the component scan that's it for this video thanks guys hello everyone this is Bhupen Sharma and in this tutorial we're going to discuss about build the entity classes for the demo application so in my lecture 4 I showed up a uh, uh, demo applications which has login dashboard and register page using bootstrap 4 so we are going to start working on that application and try to build that application as shown so let's uh so let's go through those slides again and understand uh, what all the entities we have to create so i can see that there is one entity which is order received i need to create based on the month i need to get the numbers this is an entity to collect all these informations about the main dashboard there will be a company revenue and then there is a best seller category uh, entity and one will be employ employee information so based on this page having three sections i would say that we i need to create on on almost five entities entity classes so let's go ahead and start working on that so what I did is I created a sample project called Ecom Dashboard, which is a which is basically a plain, uh, plain uh, Spring Boot project with the dependency of Web and JPA. So by default, when you create a dependency with Web and JPA um, and MySQL, it will come like that. The only thing that I did additional was to add with the Hibernate Core and Hibernate Entity Manager so these are two dependent dependencies i added to use the entity objects the other thing that we need to make sure is we need to have a schema uh, which will allow us to connect from my spring boot project to the database so i have 
I created a schema called ecom app into my local MySQL database so that I can connect to that. So let's go ahead and connect to this schema and see whether it's, it works or not. So in application dot property, we need to put these five properties to define the data source URL, the username, the password, and the driver class. Since I'm using MySQL, it's MySQL class, and then I'm using JPA Hibernate saying update. Update means any change in the entity structure in my POJO objects will, as soon as I run it, it will reflect in the DB. So now we will go ahead and start creating those entity classes. So what I did now is uh, just to cut short this video, uh, I created those entity classes. Uh, the product category has a category name, percentage best category. Now this is not an entity class. This is a plain Java object class, the POJO class. Same way if we have order received, we have uh, order collection status which will tell me how many new orders what is the revenue shipped return and all those things we have employee information so based on the dashboard page i just created these and these pojo objects now this company revenue i started with converting a sample pojo object class to a entity class so we need to use at the rate entity annotation and uh, at table structure defining what is the table name and where it mapped to so it mapped to my recom dash app and at the rate co at column will define the column name if i want to it otherwise it will take this name but i want to put a different name so i just put a different name in the label false means it make it uh, make it uh, mandatory uh, in the db and then we have a getter and setter so now we have the entity structure created for one table. We have a database. So how Spring Boot knows to connect. So if I try to run right now, it knows that there is an entity structure. It knows that there is a database to connect. But how Spring Boot is going to map that using a JPA. So we have ORM in place. We have a database in place. But still we don't have a JPA in place. So what we need to do is we need to go on the main class and then use one annotation called entity scan, which is going to scan the entity class. So entity, let's put that entity scan. Yeah, and it need a base packages. So let's put base packages equals um, my reference to the entity folder entity package so let's try to run this now and see whether it works maybe let's compile this and now package So it failed. Um, let's see what is the reason for failure. So it's saying no identifier specified for entity. So the reason being uh, because there is no ID column here which we need for relational database. So what I can do is I can create a separate class saying um, key entity right and then i can put a pk so this is my id column and every time it's required a column the only thing is i need to map this class to my to my uh, company revenue or any other class so i now i can map this id to any of the entity classes so if i change the structure of ids because id can be a numeric numbers id can be guids also it will reflect everywhere so let's go and then extend the key entity okay 
now let's try So this time it built successfully and now we can go in database and check is any change happen. Yeah, so I can see now that company revenue has been created. The entity has been created. Yeah, the class has been created. So now let's follow the same approach and apply to and every other entities try to convert those simple POJO objects to an entity object. So I copied the same structure in all the tables. The only difference is in employee, for example, I didn't put for the specific column because I thought that the column name can be same, whatever I declared as a uh, type name. Uh, so everywhere I extend the key entity and then I just put a def reference name in the schema. So let's go ahead and try to run and see. So it's build success. Let's see and check in DB. So refresh. And I can see all the table has been created. So now we are able to connect our ORM system to my DB. And as I mentioned that still now there is no JPA. So now the JP role is going to start because now we have a correct mapping and all those things persistence. Now the framework is there, which connect my objects to my DB. Now we can make use of JPA. So let's create a package called repositories, repositories. And then uh, let's create for company revenue repository okay. we need to create as an interface so in this we need to use at repository annotation to define that, that this is a repository and what should be the qualifier so i'll say qualifier as i'll use the same name so let's say i'll use this name yeah make it as a lower c to identify and then i can extend jpa repository uh, defining my class objects so it will be the entity class called company revenue revenue putting my entity and long so now this uh, so long okay this is playing JP repository but now this repository has been mapped with your ORM entity object and by default it will give you a lot of features so if you go inside this repository you can see you'll get functions like find all find all find all by ID save and flush delete and batch delete all get one so all these functions and it got paging and sorting as well so all these things by by just having extension by just extending the JP repository you'll get all those things now you want a specific query to return then we can write uh, an interface and then we can map it up um, so so let's create a repository now there's one more thing with that we need to do is that 
we created a repository how is string boot knows so we need to run a scan so we need to put uh, enable jpa repository and then we'll put uh, base packages equals to let's copy this one dot repositories rip okay so now my company revenue table is mapped with a jpa repository and i can use and leverage all the feature of jpa repository so let's try to replicate the same thing for other entity table as well so i um, replicate the same information by creating the interfaces for repository so now all table are now linked to a repository so that's all for this video and in the next video we're going to move further step by step approach thanks guys hello everyone this is bupin sharma and uh, in this tutorial we are going to continue from the last lecture where we have created the jpa repository and entity structure and map to the database now what we are doing is we are going to do uh, some crud operations and map those repositories by creating a services so that we can later use those services inside our controllers so let's get started so this is the last this is the same project that we left last time and with entities and repositories and now let's create a package for service and let's start with the um, interface for company let's create dashboard service so what we can do is we can in one single service we can use um, all the repository okay uh, let's create another package for Impel and I'm gonna create service Impel and then implement dashboard service. Okay, we need to create a very specific method now here i can auto wire my repository so let's start with company sorry auto wire so i auto wired it uh, so let's create an interface for list and then I say company revenue get today's revenue dash And I'm going to implement it. Implement method. And what I'm going to do is uh, company repository dot find all. So this particular met this particular method that we created in dashboard services get all the records from company revenue table. So what I did is I created a few records in company revenue table. And then whenever I use this service, I should be able to retrieve all my records. So let's go and create the other required dashboard service calls and link them to repository. 
So I almost replicate uh, the find all function, except one of the scenarios where um, when I say best category, I need to figure out uh, based on based on the boolean variable. So when I say so, I need to write a method inside the repository. So let's say product category uh, and then I say here is so I need to find all product categories based on the their best categories or not so find by and I will say best category so this is uh, the query DSL that we talked about and then in that what I'm gonna do is uh, say that uh, boolean best category So, so that's it. Uh, the JP will take care of the rest of the things because it says find by best category, and then when I order the value, I pass. Based on that, it will go and um, list all the product category based on that. So let's use this um, inside our service uh, dashboard service. So it'll say product category dot. So now I got this one method and then I'll say true. So all best categories I'll get it. So so we have created now we have created the services. So this is the basic service. So let's try to do some crowd operations on one of the table. So for example, employee, let's try to do few more crud operations like insert delete and all those things so let's say i would say uh imply so void add employee and then i'll say employee information and uh, so update employee will have and create for delete so let's say delete Employ and same thing employ so I created these crud operations now it'll ask it to implement let's implement those and now I should have employee information repository add um, save and employee information oh, okay and then say save uh, employee information and say so add in update is more or less same I have the CRUD operation for the employee information table. So my the CRUD operations are ready right now uh, for the employee information table. That's all for this video. Thanks guys.
Hello everyone, this is Bhubayn Sharma and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about about the rest endpoint for the crude services which we created uh, in our last lecture. So let's get started. So let's start creating the controller. Start with a package, uh, controller package and let's create a Java class rest endpoint controller this will be a rest controller so let's put a annotation for that and let's auto wire your service so private dashboard service dashboard service public i want list and it will be employee information at all amp I don't want any parameter and then I'll say return dashboard service dot get all employees <coughs> quest mapping value equals to employees okay so let's run it so let's see the postman I'm going to use employees and I can see um, pretty much everything in the array let's create a post call to save the record so public uh, string save employee info and then um, I can say request body request body is employee information okay and then uh, if dashboard service dot save dot add employee not equals to null It's void so if it's void then I cannot return anything so let's not or let's return then return employ save employee data saved successfully else error 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 saving employee info so let's fix this problem um, dashboard shell service when you add it you just make it so now it should fix up yep let's read on this okay the missing piece is mapping so request mapping method equals to request post and value equals to 
let's say employ slash add okay let's run this okay so let's call the url it's a employee data set successfully if i go and check in employee i can see my data is there so let's work on delete now um, public string delete amp and I'll say parameter request parameter name equals to amp amp id um, value equal there's no default value required as true and then i'll say string pk so first i need to retrieve based on the pk so in my repository i don't have anything which is based on that i can get a pk so let's create a method so it will be employee information find by pk and then i say final string pk so i created this uh, method in the repository i can call that in service as well so let's create a service uh, so I got a service created and then we can implement the service so let's implement this method and I'll say repository dot get dot find by pk and then pass this pk. So now in my controller I can retrieve uh, the pk. So I'll say dashboard uh, service dot delete employee. And then I'll say dashboard service dot get employee with pk. So okay, it's a void. And let's put in the try catch. So try. And then put a catch in case of any exception just return error if there's no exception then return delete request mapping put employee dot delete so let's run this and see whether it works or not server started and now uh, this is the url we need to call with the put method and see let's see 
it's saying deleted refresh it gone that's all for this video thanks guys hello everyone this is bupen sharma and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about how to set up a web application using time leaf so let's get started so these are the two dependencies uh, we are going to use for time leaf one is the starter and one is the security we're not going to use security as of now but in future lectures we are going to use this uh, security feature of time leaf The other thing that we need to do apart from this is to set up properties for time leaf. So let's put those properties as well. So let's build a project and see whether it compiles. Compile. So let's put our login page here. I'll say index.html and put e commerce. save it and then run it I can see that the title that I have put it is coming up correctly. Let's put something else. Save it and rerun. So I got this message, welcome to re Spring Boot course. So that's pretty much for setting up our time leaf templates. That's all for this video. Thanks guys. Hello everyone, this is Bhupen Sharma and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about configure bootstrap 4 and create a static pages for demo application. So as you know, in my previous lecture, I was talking about our demo applications to create. And in my last lecture, I just mentioned how to create a web application using time leaf. So we are going to continue with that. And then now we are going to put bootstrap 4 and the static pages for the, the demo applications, which we showed on lecture 4, I think. So let's get started on that. So as you see, this is my project, which I used for last lecture. for Bootstrap 4, I am using a SB admin uh, Bootstrap 4 theme. It's freely available on internet, so you can just download it free. So I download it, and then what I need to do is I need to copy a few of the stuff from. I copied the CSS folder, JS folder, and the vendor folder into my project resources static folder. And um, I copy the index.html to my index.html and insert the template folder. And I didn't change anything much if you open because um, by default the reference is vendor which is inside the static. Static is part of the class path. So anything after that will be referenced here. Uh, it will automatically recognize that. So let's start the server now.
okay so i can see the uh, dashboard has been loaded these are the three sections that we talked about uh, and it has been loaded successfully without any issues so that's all for this video thanks guys hello everyone this is bupain sharma and in this tutorial we are going to continue from the last lecture where we finished the creation of the services and linking with the database and jpa repository and we create all those methods that can provide us the data now uh, in this tutorial we are going to create the controllers for specifically for the view so let's get started this is the project that we left in the last lecture it has uh, everything controller entity repository and services the control that controller that we created was for the rest endpoints but this time we, want, we are going to create a controller for the view and it has all static uh, references so we need to change those static references to a dynamic references mapping with the controller and that that is something part of our next lecture so first let's start a server and see where we are Server started. Let's open in browser localhost 8080. So I can see the static page is there. So this is all information is static right now. We are going to target this particular section of the company revenue and try to create a controller and get the data from the service. So it will be controller goes to service, service goes to JPA, JPA goes to database and then comes back with the data back to the controller now how we are going to represent into the controller something we need uh, a total of revenue expense and margin for all the records that we have and we need a specific records for every month revenue so let's build the controller for this So I auto avoid the dashboard services and I created a get mapping uh, to the root and return the index. So it basically just uh, when you load the localhost 8080, it comes and redirect the same page to the index.html. Now let's start populating. So let's say populate company revenue data. Now in dashboard services we have uh, method to get the all the records from the company revenue table the problem is that this is not how we represent in the page the page reflects something else we are not simply showing the data from the data from the database so we need to do a manipulations and write a custom logic where i can get, grab those informations and pass it to my controller so i need to make a changes to my services so let's do and change the services okay so i created this um, i changed the function get revenue dash get today's revenue dash method what i did is i just uh, pass as a hash map uh, so that I can pass different parameters like labels, revenue, and then total. So if you see in the bra in the page, you have labels for this, and you have revenue here, and you have the total revenue, to total expense, and uh, total margin here. So I just created a hash map to provide all those values. So let's use the. Um, so my service is ready with all the 
information that I need for the page. But now I need to do is I need to map my service data with the view. So using a controller. So I'll use model dot add attribute and I'll say CR company revenue comma and then I'll use dashboard service dot total dash and save run and see whether it'll have any impact there'll be no impact because now we have every information is inside this model attribute but uh, we are not using that model attribute somewhere in the page so there will be no changes there so it is still will, will be a static yeah because uh, if it's dynamic then these months will be a different format if you see here uh, in db the way i save those records as jan feb and static it is january february like that so the next step is uh, we need to bind our model attribute in the ui so let's do that there are two there are two pieces here one is um, on the html side and one is on the um, the javascript side because the chart information is inside the javascript so this is the chart that we are using for revenue where we are passing labels here and then the revenue here and the other um, the other thing that we are using is uh, the total expense and uh, total revenue and total margin so these are hard coded so we are going to change these things let's do it so on the index.html page there are two changes that i did is uh, one is referencing to the namespace for time leaf uh, and then here i actually created two hidden variables uh, input tags two hidden input tags where i'm passing the labels and revenue i'm going to use these for my javascript but for revenue and expense and margin i just simply reference to cr and total revenue this this total revenue actually is mapped to a service here because everything is a hash map so when it returns back from controller to the view everything comes as a hash map and tied up to a cr which we define in our controller crs so when i reference it i say cr dot total revenue and then so let's run it and see whether it works or not yeah and this has been changed now but this information is still the old one so let's do the change for the chart as well so for um javascript side what i did is i just get the value from the hidden tag that i created here uh, and then i split with the comma because they are coming as a comma and then i just sim simply put into the label um, instead of having hard code values i just reference to that variable and let's run it now and see whether it works <clears throat> so now it this has been changed and even i can see here the value is still they are static they're not dynamic but um if i go and inspect element i should have those values inside my uh, the hidden tag so yes and the cr revenue this hidden tag has those value coming in from the controller 
so as an assignment you can just copy this project from the github just fork this project and just try to do by yourself for the revenue part let's go um and i'm gonna leave a best seller category and order received as hard-coded um, as an assignment i put it inside this lecture that you can go grab the source code and then do it i'm gonna work on employee information now so let's do it so for employee information what i did is i just simply uh, create a model attribute called ei and then reference to the service which return me all the employee so now let's go and see where we have employee information in the html should be here somewhere so right now these are all the hard code informations we are going to convert that into by reading the value from the model attribute that we have set it up so let's do it in html what i have done is i just uh, removed all the trs the table rows the static ones and then i just use the each loop of them leaf where is reference to amp to my ei ei is something which is part of my model attribute and then i use the pose object type names uh, by having from here and i just map it up uh, and that's all i did actually to change all my static code to a dynamic data table code and let's go and run it so right now i can see it has 57 entries and in my db i believe i have uh, nine entries so so i started let's go and refresh the page so i can see nine entries now and everything is mapped up including my name as well in this page we have uh, changed the ref dynamic reference from the static um, based on the controller for the company revenue chart and from the data table as a part of this uh, lecture i'll put up assignment to work on doing the same stuff for the main dash here the bestseller category and the order received that's all for this video thanks guys hello everyone this is bubin sharma and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about implementing spring security so let's get started So this is the existing project uh, from my last lecture where we left where the the dashboard page so what i did is um, i created a i renamed my index.html with dashboard.html and in the index.html i put the information about the login page so it has the username and it has the password and it has a submit button so let's run and see whether I'm getting a login screen or not. So now I'm getting a login screen. You click on it, nothing happens. No action. So uh, next thing we need to do is we need to have a login controller. So I already created this login controller. Um, it has a root slash login and access denied. I didn't create any page for access denied. Uh, I'll so if there is no page, the Spring Security will say that page not found. So I'm okay with that. Um, we'll create a security config class, and I'm gonna put all the securities. The other change I did is that on time leaf controller, which is my old controller and has mapped to root, I changed that root to dashboard. So to access this page, I need to go through dashboard and I return to my to dashboard, which is uh, 
dashboard.html. In pom.xml, I need I have added a dependency for security, Spring, Spring Boot Starter Security project. So now let's start with implementing security. Let's use a notation called configuration because it is a security configuration and then enable web security. Extends web security configure adapter. Now I need to um, now you can do two type of authentication one is in memory authentication and one is uh, data source authentication while connecting to data source which is creating a tables uh, user tables and roles tables for this uh, lecture I'm just gonna use the in memory authentication so let's uh, put that we need to override So in authentication manager builder, so here I'm gonna say dot in memory in memory authentication dot with the user. with the user and let's put the uh, user as the user and password as password with the role of user and let's create one more admin admin let's put name now role admin let's extend override one more method called configure the springs HTTP security okay here uh, I'll say we need to authorize the request so let's say authorize request so we need to permit all the request with the root so permit all the request with root um, permit all okay and all the one which has access to user so again dot and and measure so anything that comes has role has role user which, I, which we created <coughs> Apart from that, any other request need to be authenticated. So now let's um, put the login and logout. So and form login 
dot success handler dot login page which is index dot permit all We don't need a specific we need a success handler so let's create uh, a class called login login success handler yep we'll create this class okay this is for success now let's talk about what happens when it failed so and dot log out any request which has invalid http session true Clear the authentication true and log out and measure any URL with the with the URL called so I'll say new and path measure and say log out. So if I put log out on my URL, I should be logged out. Dot log out success url so once it logged out where it will go it will go to login log out dot allow them and uh let's talk about exceptional handling in case of exception what will happen let's create another uh x is denied handler let's create a class called login success handler here so in the login success handler what i did is i implement as authentication success handler i override on that authentication success so i just say that login successful and then redirect them to dashboard page same way we have to create for uh, login denied handler so let's create a login denied handler sorry access denied handler so in this handler i um, what i did is i um implement the access denied handler okay i think spring already have this class so let's change this one to um login login access denied handler that way we don't have to provide the full yeah okay and then here i'm just uh using a security context holder get context and authenticate and if it's not authenticated uh it will go to access denied it include all the resources inside the static folder as well uh, now let's uh, auto wire them so let's say auto wired login success handler i map that and then i'll say auto wired
access denied handler so this is mapped up uh okay now in time leaf what we need to do is uh we need to put somewhere where i can authenticate um we need to call the security um if for time leaf as well so here um we call this dependency for the for the time leaf spring security dependency let's make use of it so we need to call the namespace uh, for spring security 4 and then what we need to do is um, in the footer i can try uh, i think it doesn't have any footer so let's put a span or div somewhere so inside the form this is my body container and let's try after this container so let's um, put a span so in this span i'm just calling authorize is authenticated so it is going to verify uh, normally this will be part of a template the time leaf template but since i'm using only two pages i'm gonna copy um, to footer here as well okay so both the pages has that now let's try to run and see whether it works or not so it didn't work and i got a error that it has to be a password encoder so one thing that i missed out was uh, when i say i forgot to put nope nope is actually to telling the spring security that don't apply any password encoder so once i put this one and then i run it If I put anything else, I'll get a message. If I say user and password, say, and I'll get the dashboard page. So that's how the Spring Security has been configured. That's all for this video. Thanks, guys. Hello, everyone. This is Wupeng Sharma. And in this tutorial, we are going to discuss about implementing actuator for monitoring. So let's get started. What is actuator? Actuator brings production ready features to our application without having to actually implement those features by ourselves. What it exposes? It exposes a lot of DevOps operations uh, information like while running the application, health metrics, info logs, environment, JVM. You can shut down your uh, application as well through rest endpoints and you can write your own rest endpoints in spring 2 spring boot 2 actually uh, you can write your own rest endpoint and you can expose to actuator it uses http endpoints and jmx bean to enable and interact with it it comes with predefined endpoints health and info by default comes and for other endpoints we need to apply security so we need to enable them uh, in order to see the information about those other endpoints. So let's get started. What we are going to do is we are going to create a new project for actuator separately. So let's create a quick project.
we need a web and in ops we need actuator so let's put So web and actuator is there. Now let's uh, so now let's run it. no index page let's try hell actuator everything comes to actuator endpoint so i can see three different health and info because they are exposed so it's saying that status is up and info info doesn't have anything we can write we can control through properties means we can write property to define what all the info the app info and all those things now let's try to expose other endpoints as well by implementing a security so let's create a security There is one more thing we need to do is we need to allow the endpoint exposure to include all so now just to make sure that in include all the endpoints so right now health and info is there now it should allow everything yeah so now it is Let's open a browser and see. So now it is asking me user and then password. So now I can see a lot of references, bean references there. So I can get all the bean data loggers whatever the logs mappings so i got all the production ready features that's all for this video thanks guys Hello everyone, uh, this is Bhupen Sharma and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about deploying a JAR file on a Unix platform. So this Unix platform uh, can be any Unix platform. There are other ways of deploying the application on um, Amazon or any other cloud platform or Tomcat by using a WAR file. But in this tutorial we are solely focused on deploying as a JAR on a Unix platform so we are going to deploy ecom health app as a jar to the linux container the reason being i am not deploying the ecom dash app which has a login and dashboard screen because it connected to a database so i need to move my database to the cloud environment and connect it so rather than that i just uh, make it short video about how we can deploy um, so let's deploy this one because it doesn't have any dependency on database I connect it to my easy to instance and copied the jar file 
using filezilla to my ez2 and it is there in so i can see this is my jar file so let's see uh, so what we need to do is first we need to create a file so we need to go to We need to go to system and we and then I'll say health health app dot service. Let's create this file. Control X and then um, I'll give the access to this file full access So let's see here. So do and let's access again. Sorry, so do nano there. Okay. In the file for the service i created three things unit service and install unit just provide information and where the logs will go and then service will define whether what is the username and where is my executable file so i just put the location of that and then that's it um save this file after that i need to run the service command again system control yep and then now uh, that's unable unable So it create a sim link and then I need to just start. Start. So this is the command to start the service. So now the service has been started and then it will work as usual. So that's all for this video. Thanks guys.